Well, good morning for me. Hello to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with Professors De Silva and, and King. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Is that working for everyone? Yep, looking good. Very good. Uh, so I'm going to give a quick overview here of my thoughts about water security, the, the way they're linked to climate and food and energy. Uh, let me start by saying that definitions of security have varied and continue to expand. They varied over many, many years from the late 1900s when we were thinking mostly about uh, international security as superpower politics. Uh, they've expanded to uh, the field of environmental security. I'd also like to note that there's a long history of conflicts over fresh water resources, and I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, those conflicts take many forms, and I'll describe the three categories that I, I think about water conflicts in. Water as a trigger, water as a weapon, and water systems or water as a casualty of conflict. I'd like to argue that the connections between food, water, energy, and climate are very strong. And as a result, the risks of water-related disputes are growing, and I'll show some data about that as well. The debate about environment and security is a fairly long one. It's an outgrowth of the ending of the Cold War in the mid-1980s, when again, the focus was really on superpower politics, realpolitik, but it was also an outgrowth of improved understanding of environmental issues. As the 20th century came to an end, we had a better understanding of sort of the nature of global environmental challenges, uh, but also the way those environmental challenges, in particular transboundary environmental challenges, were affecting international politics and security. That debate was marked by a rich academic political science debate, but it was also enriched by a lot of case studies in the real world. The real world has really offered us uh, examples, quite explicit, specific examples, of the way environmental issues and security are related. And for me, the way water issues and security issues are related. And I know that Dr. King will talk about some of that as well. So what are some of the critical issues for water and conflict? First is background. Fresh water is very widely shared internationally. Half of the land area on earth is in what we call an international river basin. Uh, that's work that came out of Professor De Silva's group with Aaron Wolf. Uh, over 260 international river basins now have been identified. Those are river basins that are shared by two or more countries. That by itself, of course, is an international political issue. And I know that Professor De Silva will address that. There's also rising competition for water. We have growing populations. We have growing economies that increase the demand for water. There are enormous inequities and development challenges around the way water is distributed and used worldwide. Of course, there's growing environmental degradation that uh, crosses borders, that puts pressure on existing water resources and uses. And efforts to resolve international disputes around water are often inadequate. And I would note uh, that often these disputes are not international, but subnational. And so challenges associated with subnational disputes are also a difficult challenge at the political level to, to address. So the way I think about water conflicts are in three categories. Water as a trigger of conflict, water as a weapon of conflict, and water or water systems as casualties of conflict. This first category is what traditionally the discussion about water security has focused on. That is, when water is a trigger of conflict, uh, disputes over access and control of water resources, uh, where those disputes lead to violence. And we see examples in Africa between pastoralists and farmers. Uh, we see scarcity and control of water in India and Iraq and Iran have led to conflicts over water resources. But these other two categories are important as well. Water is a weapon of conflict, conflicts that may start for other reasons, uh, diverting water away from villages, opening floodgates on dams as we saw in Iraq, or withholding water from dams that ISIS controlled in Iraq during the conflicts there. We've seen poisoning of wells in Somalia. Uh, those are examples of where water or water systems were weapons of conflicts that start for political or economic or ideological reasons. 
And similarly, we've seen water systems or water resources as casualties of conflicts or targets of conflicts. Again, conflicts that may start for other reasons. And we saw this in World War II where dams were attacked during World War II. In Vietnam, irrigation systems were attacked by the United States in North Vietnam. And we've seen it more recently in Iraq, Syria, and especially in Yemen, where civilian water infrastructure was very heavily explicitly targeted during that conflict. As uh, Jocelyn Trainer said in my introduction, one of the things we do at the Pacific Institute is we maintain something called the water conflict chronology. It's an open source database, the best in the world, I would argue, that lists water-related disputes going back more than 4,500 years. Uh, this is a screenshot of that website. You can see the, um, the website is at worldwater.org or Google Water Conflict Chronology, and you'll see it. And you can get a chronological list. Uh, you can get a map uh, that's interactive. Let me give you an example of that. This is, a, again, a screenshot of the map. Each of these spots is a specific entry in the database. You can click on the click on the specific spots and get more information about the parties involved, the time involved, the kinds of conflict it was, the resources and the, the sources related to those conflicts. A little bit of data uh, from that conflict chronology, actually from 1980 up until uh, about a year ago, uh, showing the number of water conflict events per year over that period of time. And you can see a very significant increase in the number of events in recent years, uh, supporting my argument that in fact, we're seeing a growing number, a growing increase in uh, the risk of water related conflicts in recent years. Uh, here's the same graph that shows those events, but split out by the types of conflict. Green is water used as a weapon, red use is water as a casualty or target of conflict and blue is water as a trigger of conflict. Uh, and you can see again, very significant numbers especially of water as a casualty or a trigger of conflict in recent years. Uh, here's a bar chart that shows the number of water conflicts, but by region uh, for the entire database up through 2018, with a very significant number in Western Asia, that is the Middle East, uh, but also significant numbers of conflicts over time in Southern Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but numbers in every part of the world. We've seen conflicts over water resources pretty much everywhere around the world. Some new concerns at the intersection of water and energy and security. First of all, water and economic development is a growing issue related to poverty and inequitable access to water, safe water and sanitation. There are disputes about water allocations and water rights. These are contributing to the numbers of conflicts we're seeing about water and conflict. These are not just country A versus country B. These are not just international disputes, but really associated with challenges on the side of economic development. We're seeing more subnational disputes. Uh, we still see state to state disputes, which I, I know Professor De Silva will address specifically. We're seeing ethnic conflicts. We're seeing local disputes all over water resources and all increasingly common. We see more and more water-related acts of terrorism as opposed to transnational conflicts. And of course, as we see the climate change, uh, we know that some of the most significant impacts of climate change are going to be on water resources, changes in water availability, changes in extreme events like droughts and floods, uh, changes in precipitation patterns, changes in transboundary water availability, uh, both directly and indirectly as a result of the impacts of climate change. And that issue has not been adequately addressed in this field as well. Uh, quick, some quick thoughts about solutions, and we can talk more about this perhaps in the Q&A. Uh, there are lots of strategies for reducing the risks of water-related conflicts. I put them in four categories. One is technical. What can we do to address water scarcity and water quality issues? Improving the efficiency of water use reduces pressure on scarce water resources. Exploring new water supply options can reduce pressure on conflicts over scarce water resources. And if we solve some of the water-related issues about access, that can help reduce the kinds of things that lead ultimately to violent conflicts over water. 
There are economic strategies, again, for solving water problems in general that can reduce the risks of conflicts over water resources. We can reduce water subsidies for inappropriate water use or price water properly to encourage efficient use. We can modernize agricultural water use and grow more food with less water. That will reduce pressure, especially on some transboundary basins where water for agriculture is part of the challenge in shared water resources. We can invest in more infrastructure in parts of the world where infrastructure investment has been inadequate or is not being properly maintained. There are management challenges and management approaches for addressing institutional fragility. We can look at public and private and community water systems. We can address corruption and failed states. A lot of the risk of water-related conflict occurs in failed states. And if we can address institutionally how to strengthen water institutions, but also political institutions, that can help reduce the risk of conflicts as well. And of course, there are many political and diplomatic strategies to help us move away from conflict and toward cooperation, which is, again, our ultimate goal here. There are water sharing agreements that are possible, and there are examples of many. Again, I'm pretty sure Professor De Silva will address some of these. We can address the equitable water rights allocations and control uh, when we see disputes over who controls water and inequity, inequities in uh, allocations of water rights. International humanitarian law is a, plays a role here. The laws of war that in theory, but not so much in practice, prohibit attacks on civilian water infrastructure. Uh, we see that with uh, all sorts of existing laws, including the Geneva Conventions, but that by itself has not yet stopped, for example, the recent extreme attacks on civilian infrastructure that we saw in Yemen recently, and things like economic aid that can help uh, move away from conflict and toward cooperation. Uh, I participated in a, in a paper about a year ago with the World Resources Institute and the Water Peace and Security Partnership. Uh, there's a paper called Ending Conflicts Over Water that addresses this whole broad suite of solutions to water and security challenges. Google my name and ending water conflicts over water or uh, look up the title and the Water Peace and Security Partnership and you'll be able to find that paper. It's an open source paper and it's a great resource. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. I think you've given us a lot uh, to look forward to in the discussion. We'll now turn to Dr. King. You're still on mute, Professor King. Sorry about that. Can you see my slides? No slides yet. Okay. There we go. Yep, good to go. All right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about the weaponization of water resources, one of the three categories that um, Dr. Gleick just mentioned. Um, and talk about some work that's been done here. Um, for about the last five years, I've been working on a project on climate and water security here at the Elliott School. And um, it's resulted in several publications so far. So my most recent is Water and Conflict in the Middle East. Um, my contribution to that is I've really looked at um, sub-national actors, in this case, Iraqi Kurdistan, um, and how they relate to some of the larger international politics. Um, but also I've really been specializing in the area of water as a weapon. Um, and so there's three case studies I've worked on. One is Iraq and Syria. I, I rolled those um, findings out in the Washington Quarterly. Um, but an another is just looking at extremist groups, um, both in Nigeria, Somalia, and Syria, um, and, and some of those implications. But as I said, it's a climate and water security initiatives. So I'll be dialing down a bit on climate change and droughts. In, and again, in the Middle East and North Africa. So this is just um, a slide rolled up from something called Resource Watch, which is um, from the World Resources Institutes. And it's just showing that the Middle East and North Africa, the aggregate climate impacts here, um, the places in red obviously are, are experiencing the worst climate impacts. So this is aridity. This is drought, this is de desertification. <clears throat> and the blue areas here are areas that are threatened by sea level rise. 
so overall regional water stress, as you can see, this is from the Aqueduct Water Risk Atlas, which is another tool from the World Resources Institute. Um, you can see that ac across a large area stretching from Morocco, um, North, North Africa, Central Asia, um, basically equatorial areas are having the most um, overall water stress globally. So these are the areas I've focused on um, overall. And so before I get into subnational water conflict, um, you know, which is my area uh, of most expertise, I just wanted to talk about um, water and how water is used as a tool of, of power with, within conflicts. And so on the international level, um, a lot of times it's unilateral infrastructure development by one actor on a shared river basin. Um, in other words, building dams that affect downstream nations. Climate change comes in in terms of the ideas of rapid impact, um, rapid changes in precipitation related to climate change. Um, when there exist existing cleavages within a society, um, poor governance, weak social institutions, um, and existing animosities, these are all compounded by climate change. But there really has to be these underlying factors that come together, setting the scene for conflict. And then many times, at least on shared resource uh, water basins, um, the idea of unilateral infrastructure development. So where this comes into play is an idea of, again, using water for power or water for leverage. Um, and this is an idea that was developed by Mark Zaytun, um, a political scientist and hydrologist, and that's the idea of hydrohegemony. And where you see hydrohegemony would be um, in, in several different water basins, but one that's of particular concern is the Mekong. So you can see that there's a large series of dams completed upstream of Laos, Cambodia, and especially Vietnam on the productive delta there for agriculture. Um, and then this, the financing is going into new dam construction in, in Burma and Laos, mostly from China. So not only are they the upper riparian that can use most of the water, but they're also um, encouraging this water infrastructure development at a time when climate change and other factors such as a bad drought two years ago are also being noticed in the region. So about two years ago now, 2019, I worked with a group from Harvard Kennedy School and Foreign Policy Magazine um, to go out to the Emirates Diplomatic Academy and bring together young diplomats from about 30 countries where we developed a scenario about how water stress might unfold in Egypt. And so when people ask me, as they always do, you know, which areas keep you up late at night? Where do you see factors coming together? Um, that would be a, a confluence of events leading to extreme disruption. It really is this Egypt scenario that we developed going out to 2030. Um, so on the one hand, in Cairo, near Cairo, you have the Nile Delta fertile agricultural zone where the, um, most of the cultivation is along with this very narrow area. You can see on the slide that's adjacent to the Nile. Um, and then these climate impacts are flooding, saline intrusion, um, ruining the soil for agricultural uses. Um, we have desertification that's going on on each side there of the narrow fertile agricultural zone. Um, and this has potential for impacting food security, all on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the Nile, um, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam that's being developed by Ethiopia further upstream also um, threatens to cut off the water supply in Egypt, which is at least 96% reliant on water from outside of its borders. Um, and then as the scenario played out, one of the factors was environmental migration. There aren't countries in the direct region of Egypt that can absorb that migration, certainly not Israel. Um, Southern Europe has been characterized by nationalist sentiment, not able to absorb the, ref the refugees, and we thought there'd be about 30 million. So all of these things coming together um, made us understand and realize that regional institutions, at least in the context of this game, were not sufficient to deal with this problem. But another factor was we, there were um, there was a rise of extremism within Egypt, and what they did actually in the game was they scuttled a tanker in the Suez, which was something that um, almost came to pass for, you know recently in terms of a, a blockage in the Suez by a tanker. 
So I wanted to move into um, more of the advertised topic, which is the how water can be weaponized at the subnational level, but also what it has to do with extremism. So I've been working by um, producing some of these journal articles I mentioned, also um, have a single authored book under review that is um, Water Stress and Islamic Extremism in the Middle East and Africa. Um, and so my three case studies have been Syria and Iraq, the conflict there involving ISIS as the extremist group, Northern Nigeria and the middle belt of Nigeria with Boko Haram and then militant Fulani herdsmen who are also Muslim. Um, and then Somalia and Al-Shabaab. So these are the three countries, but then what they had in common during the time that I've looked at this beginning in about 2011 is they've all faced um, endemic droughts. And so again, you have climate change and environmental factors related to um, giving the opportunity for subnational groups to weaponize water in this way. And so looking at the weaponization of water um, I've come up with six different ways um, and, and that, that exemplify the um, actions of the extremist groups in these three case studies. And so I won't go through reading them all, but um, strategic weaponization is an idea that actually Dr. Gleick already alluded to, which is seizing dam infrastructure, opening the sluices, not you know closing the sluices, depending on the um, situation downstream. So for example, the Mosul Dam in Iraq was a situation where ISIS had, when they took control, <clears throat> had the ability to flood um, all the way down to the green zone in Baghdad, where, where the allied forces were. So um, it was really a strategic act in terms of being able to have virtual control over a larger area from seizing that, that dam infrastructure. Then there's the idea of water used as a weapon within the actual conduct of war. And so this would be more of a tactical weaponization. Um, another idea, of course, would be using water um, as a force of tool of coercion. So when um, populations are occupied by insurgents in that region, um, they can take control of water infrastructure, using that, again, as leverage against those groups. Um, terroristic actions, water terrorism, like poisoning wells, for example. Um, and then just this idea of using the tax base of an economy um, that, that is occupied um, in order to raise money for war fighting um, from taxing water provision. And so these were the six ways that water as a weapon played themselves out across the three case studies that, that I've mentioned. Um, I've also identified a water stress and conflict cycle that forms sort of the background of what was happening in these countries, because I said there are these existing cleavages that um, interact with the climate forcers or natural issues. And so here you just see um, water stressors in Syria um, raise the temperature, um, groundwater was going, was being depleted, there was increased drought. Um, and then the systemic outcomes related to that were, was the impact on agricultural productivity, um, which le then led to some migration, um, civil unrest, and those were the human responses. And then in the end, there was it amplified conflict, um, and there was um, this food scarcity, um, migrants moving to the peripheries of cities um, in in Syria where there weren't. Um, there wasn't the municipal base to support them. Um, and these were the some of the conditions that led to the war in Syria. And, and so that's what I found. Um, also looking at the different actors within Syria that weaponized water, it wasn't entirely ISIS, but ISIS um, was responsible for the greatest number of incidents, but and used it most frequently and deliberately. Um, and the most at the strategic level, but you can see that all the other actors involved in the war, um, with the possible exception, of course, of the United States, had some incidents of water weaponization according to these six categories that I identified. So the, the findings that I had about Syria was actually that the seizure of the Mosul Dam by ISIS um, precipitated US airstrikes in 2014 when the Obama administration became more involved in the war. And then water was a critical enabler of ISIS throughout their campaign because they used water 
um, in, in, in several dimensions across all of these categories. And of course, denying the ability of extremist groups, groups to use water is an effective tool in counterinsurgency. And I found that across the case studies. Um, in the interest of time, I won't break down some of the elements that I saw here related to the case study in Somalia. But one thing I did want to mention is that on the tactical level, Al-Shabaab um, actually was able to blow up levees in, in one case where they flooded um, American Special Forces uh, group um, and actually made them have to change positions on the battlefield where they were then susceptible to ambush. Um, so there are these tactical uses on the battlefield that really um, played themselves out in the situation of Al-Shabaab and, and their insurgency in Somalia. So the findings for Nigeria and Somalia was that essentially Boko Haram was able to exploit diminished societal resilience um, based on a unfolding catastrophe around the Lake Chad area, which again sparked migration. Um, that gave them the opportunity to use the water weapon against um, a population that had already been weakened. And also I found that there was a significant correlation to recruitment um, and there was a greater ad adherence to, um, at least a nominal adherence to extremism by the local population when food and water um, became scarce and could have been used as leverage against them. Um, in, in, the, in the case of Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the idea of using water as a weapon actually backfired um, because withholding the water and the food aid that was brought in to the situation there, which was also a humanitarian catastrophe, um, it was an ineffective approach that really lost support um, and cost Al-Shabaab Al support among the populace there. Um, and there was less correlation, of course, then to recruitment within the um, extremist group. And so what can we do to stem the tide of water weaponization as the United States or other powers that are concerned with it, Northern European countries, for example? Um, I argue that all levers, all aspects of US foreign policy have to be brought to bear. So that of course is defense development and diplomacy. On the defense side, I already mentioned that incorporating the idea of water being used as a weapon into counterinsurgency strategies is going to be extremely important, just understanding that. Um, but the development aspect probably really needs to lead. So there should be a high priority on the restoration of water infrastructure in areas that have been um, that have seen conflict, um, the the, the um, Global Fragility Act is a new vehicle through which the U.S. aid, for example, can funnel monies into fragile states, and so that that should be looked at in terms of water infrastructure. And then again, is something that Dr. Gleick mentioned is the um, diplomatic example. So there are. Um, aspects of the Geneva Conventions Additional Protocol to um, the Environmental Modification Treaty. Um, th there is a body of international law that would prohibit the deliberate destruction of um, civilian infrastructure related to water. But even these newer examples like Yemen, um, we're seeing that this has obviously not been an, an effective approach if states are not party to these agreements or they go ahead and ignore them. So um, looking more at the Defense Department, which is the organization that I'm the most involved in, in terms of talking through these issues, um, including with the National Defense Strategy, um, it's very important for the regional combatant commands, again, to integrate ideas of water weaponization and that potential into their theater campaign plans, um, and also into their, their data collection. So there's a lot of capacity resident in the United States government for remote sensing modeling um, and other tools that would help predict where water conflict could break out. And so these should be brought to bear in the context of countering violent extremism. Um, and, and there is just a lot of potential for foresight tools that can be employed, um, you know, both on the classified and unclassified level, um, if they're brought to bear um, for predicting these outbreaks. Um, and then finally, I wanted to go back to a an assessment that's um, you know a aging now, but it was done in 2012 by the intelligence community, National um, Intelligence Council, and some of these recommendations still really resonate today. And so that's the idea of again looking for legal and institutional arrangements to resolve water disputes, 
um, in advancing cooperation, um, it, improving water governance. So again, better um, remote modeling, hydrological information, um, and then encouraging the trade of products with a high water content from, so for, you know, a scenario is some of the best cotton in the world comes from Egypt. Um, you know, it's very soft, it's supple, it, it's the highest quality cotton, but should that really be the product that's very water intensive that the Egyptians are, um, are cultivating? Um, it doesn't make the most sense in terms of, um, you know, terms of trade and, and water balance and, and the high water content of what they've produced. So that, that's it. And um, if you have any questions, you see my email there and I look forward to discussion of these concepts a little bit more as we go forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. King. Your presentation of uh, the three case studies was very interesting and I'm sure will bring up a lot of questions. Um, and it turns us nicely to Professor De Silva, who is going to discuss the more kind of positive, peaceful side of the coin at some times um, when done successfully in um, managing transboundary water. So Professor De Silva, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you. So thank you to Jocelyn and also the Elliott School of International Affairs for the invitation to present today. So my talk is entitled Sharing Transboundary Waters, Tools, Techniques and Tips. Um, so what I hope to do and what I hope to discuss is talk a little bit a little bit about regions that share international fresh waters. Um, I'll describe the impacts of not sharing, and then we'll present um, tools and techniques used in water conflict management um, that promote sharing, utilizing the Columbia River Treaty as an example. And then uh, if necessary, I'll conclude with takeaway message. So international transboundary river basins, uh, that was defined earlier by uh, Dr. Glick, but I will just state it over again, refers to a river basin that's shared by two or more countries. It includes a country where fresh waters either act um, as a border between nations and or naturally flow between them. And in this slide, everything in blue represents the extent of international transboundary river basins in the world. Um, the significance of this is that two out of five people lives in an international river basin. And keep in mind that groundwater reservoirs have an even wider global extent. So this makes sharing fresh waters challenging but compounding these complexities are a rapidly changing climate and an ever growing population, uh, human population, making national and international planning challenging economically, socially, and geopolitically. And this can run the gamut of exacerbating water conflicts and or water cooperation. There is a cost associated with not cooperating. You know, this increases the likelihood of water tensions, uh, compromising effective water quality, quantity, and timing um, for downstream countries. There is limited effectiveness to address uh, waterborne diseases because you have each country perhaps addressing just the water needs and the challenges in just their strip uh, of land. And so you have poor ability to manage multiple water uses and it can also limit national and international development. This is of concern because water is such an essential part of our lives and all forms of life. And it's also essential to economic productivity. So one very creative water sharing arrangement that went beyond a straight money transaction for water delivery and utilization can be seen in the Columbia River Basin. And the Columbia River Treaty 
um, that was signed um, in 1961 and um, implemented in 1964. So this treaty is between the US and Canada and, and was designed for flood control and to generate hydroelectric power. You've got Canada agreeing to construct three storage reservoirs behind the Micah, the Arrow and the Duncan Dams. And um, they would operate them to meet the needs of the US, you know, you've got both parties would optimize um, the generation of hydro energy for which each country received half the downstream power resulting from water storage. From the US, Canada would receive upfront lump sum payment for both half the cost of averting flood damages once the dams were completed, and also subsequently for the flood control uh, for a 60 year time frame. And then the US uh, built the Libby Dam in Montana. And then you, within the treaty itself, each country keeps the, the benefits that are sort of accrued in their own country. To be clear, there are many downsides to the arrangement, which I will express in a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you about a major factor that actually contributed to the, to the development of the treaty. And that was the 1948 flood event and its impact in Vanport, Oregon. To give you some context, to, we are um, going to look at a map here of the Columbia River Basin. You've got the river carrying um, an average volume of something like 265,000 cubic feet per second of water to the Pacific Ocean. And this is like the fourth largest river discharge in North America. Um, the Columbia River tributaries are draining an area of close to 258,000 square miles. The most distant flow uh, begins at Columbia Lake, in British Columbia, eventually heading first north, then southward and westward to Astoria, Oregon, to the Pacific Ocean. In all, the Columbia River extends through, you know, British Columbia, and portions of seven US states. And this also includes 15 tribes. Historic records show that the 1948 flood has the second highest peak discharge in the Columbia River Basin. The impact was felt all along the main stem, but especially in north, just north of Portland um, in Oregon at a location called Vanport. In that particular location, 15 to 30 people lost their lives and 18,500 people lost their homes. So it was this flooding event, and in particular, the plight of the Vanport community um, that made President, President uh, Truman instruct the Army Corps of Engineers to go back to the Columbia River plans that focused at the time on harnessing hydropower. And so he wanted them to add flood control to mitigate uh, future floods of that magnitude. And I would also want to add for anybody interested in the human toll of the times and the impacts of that flooding event, uh, please Google Vanport, Oregon, 1948. So um, it was this flood then that got um, uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers to go back to the drawing boards. And um, it's this arrangement that culminated in the Columbia River Treaty between the US and Canada. So today we have this very creative water arrangement um, However, this water agreement did not offer equity to all actors. Some actors who have relationship with the river and interests in the river were left out. 
and among them are the indigenous communities who were not allowed to participate in treaty negotiations. And at the time, there was no rights implemented to address the needs of the ecosystem, um, nor the river species. We are in a unique time frame right now because there is opportunity um, to rectify these injustices um, since the treaties uh, stipulates that after September 16, 2024, with a 10 year prior notice, this treaty arrangement can be subject to change if either countries wish. So, um, Today, entities and stakeholders are at various stages in these discussions. So institutions and organizations can be very much part of the answer to providing resources that assist in the sharing of transboundary waters. Among them are the formalized river basin organizations and commissions, along with informal river basin consortia. Um, in fact, between 2008 to 2014, five universities in the basin convened the Universities Consortium for Columbia Basin Governance, conducting annual symposium on trans transboundary river governance in the face of uncertainties as it relates to the Columbia River and the treaty. And this was in light of the potential treaty negotiations. The universities convened and facilitated non-party forums basin-wide and provided decision-relevant information and studies. And they wanted to inspire and prepare future leaders by bringing together people that were part of the original decision-making process and treaty. And they wanted to bring students that would create scenario driven approaches and participate in mock negotiations. When appropriate, another approach to national and international discussions and workshops around sharing is when international entities literally, literally um, can remove the political boundaries um, off of a map or river basin map and uh, as is done in this uh, slide, you're looking at a fictitious river basin. This allows the parties then to focus on basin wide interests and needs. However, placing the borders back on the map after discussions and after negotiations, one can then consider equitable benefits for each country. So that's a crucial measure. Um, regarding best practice, practices to encompass sharing, um, what's recommended? Uh, being inclusive of decision making processes by incorporating a broader suite than of interests, even um, when they appear to be at odds. So, for example, how do we address sedimentation problems in the river caused by loggings and at the same, same time, build robust logging industries. Best practices should also include visiting the resources, conducting field trips, because movement beyond the conference room brings um, a group to greater awareness and understanding. When parties want to use the same resource, focus on enhancing the quality of the resource. It's the age old adage, ask not what, ask not what your river system can do for you, ask what you can do for the river. And then practice, practice listening in a deeper and meaningful way to build trust and build relationships. And um, I don't know that I have to give a rundown of what I've already said. So to save on time, I will not do that. But I will say the very last one is practice listening, uh, because listening is at the heart of conflict transformational processes. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor De Silva. Thank you for 
rounding our um, panel out um, with those tools, tips, and techniques for transboundary waters management. So we have our um, first couple of questions here to start our Q&A. For the rest of the audience, feel free to either use the chat box feature or um, raise your hand and we can unmute you if you would like to ask your question. Um, so I'm going to first lump these two questions together um, into a, a larger, broad question, uh, kind of directed at all three of you in a unique lens. Um, so we have, when working with policymakers, what strategies do you use to emphasize the importance of climate change and water security in future strategy and policy making? And perhaps, Dr. Glick, you could also include how to talk to policymakers about growing less intensive water um, crops and agricultural. Um, Professor De Silva, perhaps you could look at the United Nations and UNESCO as the policymaker, and Dr. King, more so the policymakers being the um, intelligence and security communities. So, um, um, thank you in, in advance for taking a stab at um, that question. And Dr. Glick, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. So partly that depends on who the audience is. Uh, you know, if this audience, if the audience needs to hear, to be convinced of what the problems are, uh, my communications efforts typically focus on describing the science and the nature of the problem, the problems that we face, and in particular, the interconnections among them. It's you know, there, we've often talked about water over here and energy over there and security over there and the, the communities don't mix, but these issues are so interrelated. It's a really important point to get across the message that they are connected and that solving them simultaneously can often have multiple benefits. Uh, if the audience doesn't need to be convinced about the nature of the problem, but is more interested in solutions, then, you know, my conversation is typically focused on solutions. And again, it depends a little bit on the audience, but if the if it's a water audience, they're interested in how do we address broadly our water problems? How do we meet basic human needs for water and sanitation? How do we provide water uh, safely for communities that don't have it? How do we address water quality problems? And those things can help in the long run reduce the risks of conflicts, but are focused more in the water area. Um, but I've also had the opportunity to do many briefings for the international community, for the security community, for the intelligence community. And there, my experience, and I suspect Dr. King's is similar, is that they're really interested and engaged with these issues. Uh, the international military security and the intelligence community, they understand that their job is to understand risks and threat. Uh, and if they can be brought to understand the connections between these environmental issues and security issues, then they're very engaged in how to talk about solutions and strategies moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, since Dr. Glick did point to the security community, perhaps Dr. King, this is a good moment for you to jump in. Yeah, so um, I, th I think it was covered a bit in terms of um, the idea that the security community um, inherently has the capacities to assess risk. Um, it's what they've always done. I guess it's just convincing them of, of what the risks are they should be looking at. Um, so one way I think about it is that um, when talking about climate change and water stress, it's easier to talk about water stress because it's the most sort of visceral and immediate impact of climate change. Um, and, and so without, let's just say we're on Capitol Hill, we're, we're looking for bipartisan consensus. If you're speaking to um, you know, those that are entrenched in their opinions about climate change, you can say, well, you know, it, we're talking about resilience. We notice um, these impacts on water, people are thirsty. We notice the frequency of disasters. Um, that, that are happening just about everywhere now. Um, you know, so let's talk about those and in the, in the solution set to that. Um, and so then when you have people that are interested in Congress and the issues and they're curious, um, you have the policymakers a little bit more curious. Those are the ones that would then turn around and ask the intelligence community for the analysis. Um, but you know, they have to be, the intelligence community has to be asked the right questions um, in, in order to actually do that analysis. And so I think there's a building consensus about how important the issue is 
Um, but the overwhelming priority, as, as you know, is from the Biden administration is conflict, COVID, China, um, and climate change. And, and so put that push that's coming from the White House now um, is really um, so important that the defense community and the intelligence community are just looking at how to implement that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm getting an overwhelming uh, message of cooperation and learning to see eye to eye. Um, on that note, uh, Professor De Silva, can we go to you with more of um, an international perspective through your work with the UN and UNESCO? Yeah, so of course, um, you know, there is a very, they're on the pulse, the United Nations is on the pulse of a global perspective. Uh, it's just naturally made up of an, an international group. Um, I think the challenge for me is the, uh, is the enforcement. So, so, you know, you have this body, you have the input, you have the construction of uh, policies, but I, it, it is limiting in that how is it going to be enacted and how, and, and I guess it depends on the country, it depends on resources availability, but um, is there an enforcement mechanism or an incentive mechanism and, um, it also, whatever policies come out, have to be mirrored in some way with what each country is prepared to do and with their own uh, policies within their own nations. All right, thank you. Thank you for that nuanced, multi-layered um, answer. Um, so we are going to turn to another question on desalination um, and the question regards um, if salination will ever or desalination will ever become an affordable and feasible option to provide relief for water scarce regions in both the United States and abroad. <laughs> Does anybody have a particular uh, feeling for taking this? Perhaps Dr. Glick? Yeah, so very quickly, uh, desalination is already a mature technology. It's used very widely in the Middle East where water is especially scarce and where energy is available for the energy intensive nature of, of desalination. Uh, we have a few plants in the United States and one big one in Southern California. The, the short answer is it's an expensive energy intensive alternative, but it works. And when other alternatives are not available, uh, we'll see more and more desalination. It's never likely to be cheap enough for agriculture, which is of course the dominant use of water worldwide, but for high valued industrial uses and commercial uses and residential uses, uh, it is uh, a piece of the solution. Hmm. Thank you, that is good to know and kind of looking towards uh, Israel in the future and potentially some of the technologies they're employing. Um, so as, as the moderator, I'm going to take a, my chance to ask one final closeout question. And I will say to the audience members, if you are at all interested in uh, following up with some questions, the, um, our speakers were kind enough to share their emails um, and their presentations, if you may know. Um, so I would like to know a little bit more about some of the most prominent effects, um, in your opinions, about the effect of COVID-19 on the nexus of water, energy, and food? Um, I know that's maybe a big question, so maybe a small Snapchat, sm small shot of it, um, small piece of it. And um, perhaps we can kind of fire, go around with some thoughts. Um, Dr. King, can we start with you? Okay, I'll be um, quick here. You, you know, I'd, I'd say, Looking at the results side, um, uh, you know, I would say that the international organization's ability to um, work together, like the WHO, um, and, and really address a problem as serious as the global ep epidemic, um, was shown to have enough weaknesses that it worries me about um, approaching things like climate change or the water, food, energy nexus. Um, you know, it really showed that 
it, it's difficult to build the consensus during a situation that's unfolding so quickly. And so I just hope that the, you know some of these other challenges on the water food security um, nexus um, are unfolding less quickly and there's more time to make decisions informed by better science um, and, and to really prepare for those challenges as they're coming along. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Professor De Silva, can we turn to you? Yes. Um, <laughs> so I, I would just add that I think that um, this particular time frame has just shown us our vulnerabilities um, on a number of different levels, individually, um, socially, uh, nationally, and internationally. And um, it just shows us where there's just a lot more work to be done um, on every level in society to bolster all aspects of uh, our food chain and, and our lives. And that's all I can say on the matter. Thank you, I appreciate those words. All right, final words, um, Dr. Glick. Yeah, I would note that uh, at the Pacific Institute, my institute, we did a series of studies related to water and COVID uh, a year ago during the, during the peak of the crisis. Uh, if you go to pacinst.org, P-A-C-I-N-S-T.org, you'll see, you can see our publications. Uh, probably the most relevant piece here is that the COVID crisis really raised some positive awareness of the urgent need to meet basic needs worldwide for water and sanitation. Uh, that you needed safe water, you needed sanitation to help address some of the consequences of the COVID crisis, for example, for hand washing, for, for human and public health issues. Uh, and that helped spur a renewed interest in, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, SDG 6, the Sustainable Development Goal 6, is related to water and access to water and sanit sanitation, setting targets for the year 2030. And anything that we can do to meet basic human needs for water and sanitation universally can have feedback effects and help reduce the risk of conflicts over water, access to water and, and, and uh, control of water resources, the issue we've been discussing more directly here. So it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a way to think about how interconnected all of these issues are and how positive some of the solutions in the water space might ultimately have for reducing tensions over water resources. Well, I appreciate that uh, and on a positive note. <laughs> and thank you very much uh, for joining us to uh, all our audience members. And thank you to our speakers, Dr. King, Dr. Glick and Professor De Silva. Thank you very much for joining us and please keep an eye out for the next event in this series. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Um, thank you. Thank you.